In uh, speaking of medieval education, it's important to uh, have in mind the setting in which it occurred. Uh, and uh, we've seen that at its uh, beginnings, as it moves off from the time of Boethius and Cassiodorus Senator, uh, it is localizing itself in the monastery. And we mentioned uh, or gestured in the direction of a mention of the political and social conditions which uh, made that uh, perhaps inevitable. But uh, in the monastic uh, uh, setting, uh, the liberal arts uh, uh, preserve themselves as a kind of remnant, these fragments we've shored against the ruin uh, of uh, pagan uh, philosophy. Uh, if you and I look at the uh, seven liberal arts divided, as you know, into two groupings, uh, the trivium and the quadrivium, uh, grammar, rhetoric, and logic, uh, the trivium, th the arts of the uh, three arts of the trivium, and the quadrivium, uh, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy, uh, when we look at those and then we think of, of the totality of Plato's writings or the totality of uh, Aristotle's writing, this will seem like a, a very thin uh, portrayal of what uh, these men had thought of as the scope and extent of, uh, of uh, philosophy, uh, as indeed it is. Uh, and it's not until uh, the recovery of uh, knowledge of, the, of these men in their uh, completeness that it will be seen how uh, much of a fragment uh, liberal arts are, but uh, the liberal arts are. But nonetheless, they were, uh, for all practical purposes, secular education. The, the, these represented the achievements of reason uh, through uh, much of the, uh, of the Middle Ages, what I'm calling the early Middle Ages, that is up to the year 1200. Uh, the um, way in which the arts w were studied uh, is, of course, uh, uh, important as well. The, there were certain authors, octores, uh, which, uh, who were associated, and works which were associated with each of the arts. Uh, and what the scholasticus or schoolmaster did was, in effect, to give a explanation of the text of the work which stood for grammar, uh, let's say, or a logical work of Aristotle, uh, rhetoric, uh, and so too with arithmetic, uh, music, and, and uh, the other. Uh, and it is a, it's an interesting uh, uh, study in itself to see what authors and books functioned within that, uh, within that curriculum. But what was produced by this mode of teaching were uh, commentaries on these fundamental works. So that, uh, and perhaps uh, the um, practice of uh, Boethius had its great influence here. I mentioned that after he had translated um, logical writings of uh, Porphyry and Aristotle, he then produced commentaries on them, explaining this is what the text means. Uh, and uh, this uh, seemed right uh, to uh, his successors in the Middle Ages, and they produced, as they did on Scripture itself, and as been, had been done from time immemorial, uh, they produced uh, commentaries on these works of the liberal uh, arts. The, uh, the commentary of, um, of um, Boethius on Porphyry had another uh, very uh, profound influence on medieval education. Uh, in the course of talking about uh, what he called, what are called the five predicables that have to be understood before one can uh, understand the ten genera that include the, the, uh, the totality of things uh, that uh, Aristotle lays out in the categories, the predicables that Porphyry talks about in his introduction to the categories are what? Genus, species, difference, accident, and property. And um, as he uh, sets these forth and is about to discuss them, giving them definitions that would have uh, a long and, uh, and noble history uh, in medieval logic, Porphyry alludes to a difference that arises uh, between uh, Platonists and Aristotelians on the logical status uh, of these uh, entities that he's going to talk about, genus, species, uh, and so forth, the universals. Huh? Uh, and uh, what, uh, what Boethius, or what Porphyry uh, uh, said is this, the question arises as to whether they're real or merely figments of the imagination. Uh, and if they're real, whether they're corporeal or incorporeal. And if they're incorporeal, whether they are associated with bodies or separated from them. Those three questions, and you can see how 
uh, each question presupposes a certain answer to it. So the second presupposes a given answer to the first, and the third a given answer to the second. Those three questions constitute what comes to be called by a historian the problem of universals. Uh, and insofar as porphyry became one of the set pieces of medieval education in the uh, uh, early Middle Ages, we get commentary after commentary on porphyry. And just as uh, Boethius, when he commented on porphyry, see, porphyry, once he gives those three questions, says, now these are too difficult to discuss here, so we'll just set those aside. Well, of course, every commentator, beginning with uh, Boethius himself, uh, in effect is saying, well, they're not too tough for me, and he will take them up and give us a solution or an answer to those uh, three questions. And historians have uh, given us portraits of the early Middle Ages in terms of the variations of solution uh, to the so-called problem of universals, which again consists of those three Porphyrian uh, questions. Uh, this was this was fateful. We, we get rather weary of it after a while because there seems to be not much uh, variation uh, left uh, as we uh, as the commentaries pile up on one another and become in their turn quasi authorities for subsequent uh, discussion uh, and the and uh, and the like. Uh, in the case of Abelard, who in the uh, in the uh, uh, at the um, uh, 11th century, uh, we have uh, someone who is noted for his uh, independence. Uh, he comes out of Normandy and uh, to study uh, and uh, comes from a, a minor noble family uh, and uh, comes to uh, Laon to, to study. And uh, the, the, the story of his early career is the story of his life, uh, in effect. Uh, he is a student for a minimal period, weeks, let's say, and suddenly he decides he knows more than the teacher. So he sets up uh, his own school as a rival school to uh, that of his teacher uh, and uh, is, uh, is uh, uh, an electrifying character, a very popular teacher, gutsy and brash and all the rest, and infuriates uh, the uh, established uh, professors. Uh, uh, he falls ill and returns home and uh, comes back then to uh, Paris where now he decides to study uh, theology and the same pattern is repeated. Uh, he listens for a little while and he says, I can do that and uh, he begins then to rival his, uh, uh, his, uh, his master. Uh, he is a very exciting uh, figure, uh, Abelard. Uh, in, uh, but in logic, uh, to hook him up to what we've been talking about in terms of the commentaries on Porphyry, we would assume that having produced, as he did, a number of commentaries uh, on the set logical works, including Porphyry, uh, Avalar then decides to write an independent work of logic called the Dialectica, and we turn to it with great uh, expectation. Let us say we become a little... Um, uh, we've become a little weary of the uh, countless uh, discussions of those three questions of uh, Porphyry, and we figure now we're going to get something new. We're going to get something, well, we don't. What we get is pretty much a paraphrase of those same logical work uh, and the logic of Vetus, the logic of Vetus, as it was called, the old logic, uh, the books that had been from time immemorial, the set pieces for uh, medieval education. Abelard doesn't go beyond them in any in any significant uh, way. His uh, his uh, ventures into theology, of course, were uh, the ones that uh, got him into uh, into trouble. That plus the fateful occasion when he uh, accepted uh, the task uh, of instructing uh, a young girl, Heloise, uh, in uh, logic, and he did this at the behest of her uncle. And the story is well known. They fell in love. Uh, and the uncle was infuriated, uh, and uh, uh, he um, set uh, a gang of people on Abelard, and they castrated him. Uh, and uh, Abelard then disappeared in uh, shame and entered a monastery. Huh? Uh, and uh, th we might think that this would uh, this would be more or less the end of his career, but his monastic career was almost as uh, turbulent as his uh, as his uh, secular career. Uh, Abelard was not a priest, it should be noted. He was a clerk uh, when uh, this episode with uh, Eloise um, um, uh, took place, uh, so that he was not under a vow of chastity. Uh,